Uh, we're going to start breakout session uh, number one on watershed protection and community involvement. This breakout session will include three presentations. We'll try to uh, allow at least uh, a couple of questions after each speaker. And uh, following, the following the presentation, uh, the presentation is going to, three presentations will end around 12.30 and then we'll break for lunch. So I would like to introduce our first speaker and he doesn't really need an, uh, an introduction because he just finished speaking. <laughs> He's back again. <laughs> He's so good. Dr. Chi Ho Sham. Well, thank you for having me again. And I guess you'll be sick and tired of my voice pretty soon. At least I don't speak like Bostonian, right? <laughs> How are ya? All right, uh, this particular talk, I want to uh, really get into a more, more on the technical issue. I think the first talk this morning was more about you know, what could be done from the water utility angle, but you actually can see is that even going through those six elements or the six uh, uh, process, uh, you need partners. I, I think I cannot emphasize enough about the role of collaboration, of reaching out, being transparent. You know, those are really key issues that when you try to bring everyone together at the table. Uh, I work on source water protection across the country, so when I go to the Midwest, for example in Iowa, um, you know, we are, we're dealing with agricultural issue, and you really need to communicate with the the farmer, and now of course if you are really in, in that sector, it's the producer. We don't call them farmer, they are the producers. And then you are looking at the, uh, the service provider, and you need to bring them into the flow of the conversation. And again, if they understand their action have some consequences, actually they are much more willing to modify that process. Now maybe they will not say, I'm not, I want to stop farming altogether but they might modify their process to make sure that what they do is much more responsible uh, to the environment. So for this project, I'm gonna look at the value of watershed. Uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about source water protection is that, well, when you do source water protection, they say, well, I'm gonna put money out to either buy easement or I buy land or I implement best management practices. There's a cost associated with implement that, that program. But what's the benefit? Well, and it's really tricky. It's almost like I usually compare that to ourselves, like the vaccination program. You got vaccinated, you don't get sick. But how do you quantify not getting sick? It's not easy. So it's basically the same thing. In source water protection, it's a preventative approach. That means you got to figure out, is that a benefit? So this is actually one of the many attempts uh, that we're trying to do is to quantify, okay, if we're gonna protect the forest, what would that do? Now, I, I will assume, you know, if you study the history of upstate New York, you will find out that this part of the country was much more deforested in the probably about 100, 200 years ago as compared to now, because uh, in New England, which I'm more familiar with, New England was 80% deforested during the peak time when everybody's migrating in, and now, New England is 80% forested. It's a completely flip around. So you, you, you will see this, that the hydrology is changing. And what also happened to is that the, the stream is changing, the amount of uh, water that we're dealing with is changing, the quality is changing. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. And uh, hopefully I can, again, use this. Again, you know, I, I always like to acknowledge my uh, uh, collaborator or the, the the partner in crime, and, and American Water Work Association, the Technical Educational Council actually gave us a little bit of money to work on this project. We also have the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Community, and they are actually founded because of a trade dispute between U.S. and Canada, that Canada was dumping wood into the United States, so that dispute set up this trust fund, and this trust fund actually allow them to actually fund different projects uh, for uh, their protecting their, the forestry. And in this case, forestry associated with water resources. The Trust for Public Land, we use quite a bit of information from the previous study. And then also Dr. Uh, Morgan of Beaver Water District, 
uh, Dr. Wazinet uh, with the U.S. Forest Service, and also the various different water utility that responded to a survey that we administered. So the, uh, the outline for what we're going to talk about today is give you a little bit of background, history, uh, what is the current effort that we've been working on, because the project is almost done, but not quite yet. And so we are still uh, finishing it up. And then the sum so, so summary. So actually, you're the first one to get to see this result. So don't say anything, right? You know, if you say anything to anyone, I'll, I'll find you. OK. Just kidding. Uh, so watershed protection. The background is that we know forests protect land, and it actually produce water of high quality. Okay? This is through natural process. Some of you heard about the term ecosystem services. That is the service that provide by the ecosystem. That is actually regulating and it's actually making sure that the water is much cleaner as it leaves the forest. About two thirds of the runoff in the lower 48 state come from forested land. So we have a lot of water that downstream, whether you're in the Mississippi or the Ohio River, a lot of the water came from forested land. And a lot of water utility use land acquisition to maintain and resource forests to protect their source water. You know, case in point, in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority, they uh, protect the land around the Quabbin Reservoir, and that is one option that they've been doing, New York City. And then you can go into other places like Seattle and Portland, Oregon, uh, San Francisco, and you, you know what's the commonality among these water systems? They don't filter their water. And they're used, but we're saying that really they are using the forest to filter your water. They're not using a sand filter to filter your water. So I'm not saying that they're not filtering. They are, they're a protection measure. Uh, in other places that they don't have the luxury, that they don't have the forest, then they have to actually do a lot more in terms of uh, treating the water. So uh, with proper management, forest to watershed associated with lower treatment costs, and this is kind of the assumption that always been made. The question is that can we quantify it, okay? So here this is a map. It's actually produced by the US Forest Service. Uh, Travis actually did this map with, with his student in the, university, uh, the Colorado State University. And you can see is that the, uh, the surface of drinking water importance, <laughs> and a lot of the places here See where in the, in the eastern part of the United States, you, know, you look at New York. Very important. And then the, this is uh, the, how important it is. You can also see is that, again, the, the forests are very important in places like New York State, Pennsylvania, and New England. Now, of course, when you get into the Midwest, well, there's no forest to talk about. So we don't have to worry about that. But then you get into the high elevation. You also have the, uh, the, the Rockies, and those are also our forests, and those forests are also very important. Now, there are also, the, a lot of forests are not very healthy. There are also disturbances that are going on. You know, some of it, it will be from development, and you will see is that development is actually a threat to some of the watershed. One of the projects that I've been working on, it's in, in between Maine and New Hampshire. It's called the Salmon Fall uh, uh, Watershed. And they are actually listed as one of the most threatened watershed. The reason why is that it's development. People from Boston want more land, they move out. Because if you come to Boston, you know is that we'll all live on postage size stamp uh, type of lot. We don't have a lot of land. And so you've got development is a threat. Insects and disease, a lot of you know, invasive species, and even non-invasive species. Some of you have heard about you know, the pine beetle infestation in the, in the Rockies. Well, they, they are native species, but because now the climate change, they don't have the second free cycle to actually kill off the larvae. So they add, actually now proliferate, and you have more problem with these insects. And then fire, right? And you see those spectacular forest fire, and actually on my computer, my screensaver is actually a forest fire, because I worked on those projects. And forest fire had major impact on water utility. That when, after the uh, forest is burned, the water come, through, come off that land, have completely different geochemistry. And high turbidity, a lot of nutrient, and what you got start seeing is that major impact on the downstream water utility. 
So uh, there's a lot of work that was done in the past. Again, I hope like these, uh, uh, Maureen will post these for you guys. I don't want you to just write, write notes feverishly. Uh, the, the, the Trust for Public Land, or TPL, along with the American Water Work Association, had worked together and tried to quantify it. And at one point, they actually collected data from 27 water system, and they measure the forest cover within the watershed and uh, by quantifying what they basically saying, and this quote had been used a lot, and some of my colleagues are not very happy, that they want to really delete it. They say every 10% increase in forest cover, the treatment and chemical costs associated with the water utility downstream generally go down by 20%. Okay, because you, you, re you have more forest cover, the turbidity, you know, the, the milkiness of the water, the, the, cl the clarity of the water. Uh, will actually improve. So in that case, you, you, you do less treatment and also uh, associated with those, you have less organic coming in. Some of you might know is that if you have a lot of organic material like uh, algae or, or leaves coming into your water system, if you zap it with chlorine, which is the most common disinfectant that we use, it generates something called disinfection byproduct. You know, trihalomethane and haloacetic acid. Those are carcinogens. So that's one thing that they worry about because they have to measure how much of these byproduct is being generated if you're zapping it because you need to zap it because if the surface water, they might have bacteria, they might have virus, they have bugs. That's one mechanism that you can kill them off or, de or inactivate them. So they will see is that if you have a forest, you actually can reduce the treatment cost because the turbidity of the water is lower. And so they, uh, they the, but the problem is that, generally uh, speaking, they don't have a huge sample size. Any statistician here you know is like 27 cases, especially it's highly variable. And you can see the scatter of these plots. And so they end up like removing some of the outlier and in general they would say there is a relationship and the relationship have an R square of about 0.5, okay? Then, then uh, TPL say, well, that's really not good enough. I'm gonna do more. So they actually uh, get some funding from EPA, US Forest Service, and the University of Massachusetts. They together, they work on this. This paper was never published. It was a white paper. It's available on their website. And what they have found is that the land cover characteristic are associated with source water quality. That's pretty obvious. You've got a nice reservoir, a nice forested cover watershed, you will generally have higher water quality. And you will see is that the total organic uh, carbon, which is the organic that we're talking about, is associated with decreased uh, percentage forest cover. The less forest you have, you see a higher you know, increase in the organic. And then also increased treatment costs is it, uh, associated with increased total organic carbon. And there's a weak relationship because th there's a lot of variability in the data set. And you can see it's here, this is the variability. It's not quite a shotgun blast. You kind of see there's a trend uh, in this area. And this is between uh, forest cover and turbidity. And turbidity is a measure of how clear is your water. You really want clean water, then it's as clear as possible. Because you don't really necessarily want to see when you turn your tap on some color water coming through, right? even though they might not kill you, but it's just not what we like to see. And then uh, the other relationship we can see is that uh, forest cover and total organic carbon. Now this one, if you see there's a trend, I don't know what medication you're on, but it's more of a <laughs> shock and blast that we, we see here. And one of the reasons why they, they, it was a problem is that because they lump all these water systems from different ecoregions. There are forested area, there are grassland, there are different places. So all of a sudden, you have a really much, much broader set of data. Um, so, uh, but when you look at there are forest cover and treatment costs, again, from that data set, it's really hard to say because you, you might be able to say draw a line somewhere like straight across, but if you have a line straight across, that means there's no relationship. But you want to have some kind of relationship, but it's not demonstrated. So they, they made a lot of remark, and we actually take those to heart when we are uh, putting this study together. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but you know, like I said, you can read through the, the slide later on. So they make a lot of observation about what they have done, the lessons learned. I always say is that, you know, I, I like 
well, I, I won't say I love failure, because you know, failure actually teaches us a lot more of what's going on, the lessons learned. You know, things that you are successful, you're like, oh, I win this, I'm moving on. You know, you don't have to worry about like, what, what did you go, what did go wrong? And here, there's a lot of stuff that have gone wrong. And so we want to learn like, what they have uh, get through, uh, through this process. So, uh, and then in 2014, there are also other work that was done. There was an article published by uh, Todd Gardner uh, and, and his colleague. And Todd is with, with the World Resources Institute. And they did a study. They looked at, again, your source water protection, whether there is a value associated with it. He's more of an economist, uh, a finance person. And he says that there is really a relationship based on his meta study is that there is a 1 to 4 or 1 to 5 ratio of protection versus treatment. So a dollar you put in for your protection, you get four or five dollars worth of treatment saving. So there is a relationship that based on Todd's work. And then the other example is that this is more of a groundwater system in Rinzen, Iowa. You know, I mentioned earlier, I, I do a lot of work in uh, the Midwest also. The groundwater is full of nitrate. Okay. Most of you probably know that nitrate, we have actually federal standard, a maximum contaminant level that you should not exceed 10 parts per million because if you have too much nitrate, if that water is being used to feed infant or make formula for infant, the digestive system convert nitrate into nitrite, which then stop the blood carrying capacity of your hemoglobin. They turn blue, then they can die. That's the blue baby syndrome. And so that is a standard why they set. And so what they see is that in the groundwater they are using, Nitrate is keep on going up. Now, where did that come from? Well, if you think about farming area, fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer, and especially you know when corn price was really up. Remember those days when uh, you know we have ethanol plants that like, popping up left and right. Well, the farmer want 200 bushel per acre, and to get 200 bushel an acre, you need a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. And nitrogen fertilizer also burn your soil, and you have no organic left in the soil. So there's all these unintended consequences. So the, the nitrate go into the ground, and also at the same time, some of you also know about confined animal feeding operation. You know, there are more pig in Iowa than there are people, and well, what do you do with their waste? Land application. So you're now going into these places that you have Manure application, fertilizer on top of it, and we were doing some uh, fuel measure and say, well, you can farm that fuel for the next 10 years without any fertilizer because there's so much in it. And, but of course, a lot of them end up leaching down into the groundwater. So what they see is that they are running into problems. They can do a denitrification plant. You can use RO, you can use various different process to take the, the nitrogen out, but it's going to cost them $3 million over three years. Okay, and then they decided, well, why don't we go buy that piece of land to contribute water? And they end up spending about point, uh, I'm sorry, three million over 30 years because we annualize it over uh, this period. That uh, the land purchase come to about 0 0.025 million over 30 years. So in that case, if you do the ratio, is that if, a, if you have one dollar of prevention, you now achieve about 120 dollars of saving. So. There, there are ways you can quantify it, but in the forest environment, it was a little tougher. So back in 2012, uh, uh, Travis approached American Water Work Association and said, well, we'd like to sort of redo the study to try to quantify how forest is related to water quality and how water quality is related to treatment costs. So this is kind of how it got started. I'm not going to bore you with the detail. But basically what ended up happening is that that project was funded, jointly funded by the American Water Work Association and also the U.S. Endowment of Forestry and Community. And instead of just shotgun blast using every single thing under the sun, we actually targeted two eco-region. One in the eastern forest and one is in the western forest. So we want forest. We don't really necessarily need to look at grassland and sort of the, uh, the swampy area down the, the southern portion of the United States. So that's, uh, and then we uh, uh, put together a survey. We actually have a long version of the survey, then we find out that people are too busy, they won't have time to fill this out. So we actually shortened this survey, and then we run it twice. 
and we end up the first run with the uh, the long survey we got 14 and the second run we have uh, 16 and then also we have some uh, system have multiple sources uh, so the purpose again in for our study is to quantify the relationship among watershed health as indicated by forest cover uh, the more forest cover the healthier it is uh, and that relationship with water quality is depicted by water quality data and the water quality intake and the water treatment cost is presented by the water treatment expenditure linked to turbidity, total organic carbon, and total suspended solid. So we, we use GIS, uh, we go and uh, look at data, and US Forest Service actually have this data set called From Forest to Faucet. And it's publicly available. You can talk to them, and they, if you have a local uh, US Forest Service uh, agent, you know, they can retrieve the data. It's based on kind of a larger scale watershed. So if you, if you, the watershed is within that, you can have the large scale watershed. If you want to get zoom into one specific smaller watershed, you will still probably have to process some of the data to get that information specific for your smallest uh, watershed. But here, this is the result. Now, these are uh, the forest cover, and this is the, uh, the turbidity. And you will find is that you can have this, you still have the scatter, but generally you will see a line. So the more forest cover, the lower is the turbidity. Okay? Again, turbidity is the measure of the water quality, how murky, how uh, uh, milk-like it is like. And then also the second one is the turbidity versus the, the cost. You know, how, the higher is the turbidity, the higher is the cost for the treatment. This is all basically uh, the chemical cost at this point. So the, uh, the preliminary result, this is the one that I say, you know, I want to find you if you release this information. No, just being silly. So a 1% decrease in forest cover, if it's uh, loose to development, it will cause a 3.8% increase in turbidity, okay? based on our data set. And then a 1% increase in turbidity <coughs> will lead to a 0.3 to 0.4% increase in treatment costs. So the direction is that you take forest out, turbidity go up, treatment costs go up. Okay, so that you can see the relationship. And I would try to simplify it to just sort of let you know like, what does that really mean. So in, for the system that involved in our study, let's just say there's an average plant that produces 19.3 million gallons per day and has a chemical cost of about $105 per million gallon of water. That's like the alum that you have to buy or the polymer that you have to buy to, to coagulate. The, uh, the, the material so you can filter it up. Okay? That's what we are looking at. That's the chemical that we're talking about. Mostly it's alum, polymer, that, that front part of the water treatment in the filtration plant. Because you, what you want to do is to grow those particles into bigger pieces so when they go to your sand filter, it can be filtered out. And that's uh, what we are dealing with in this case. So an extra kilometer, you know, because you know we have the scientists, uh, of the forest cover it will provide annual saving of the, uh, the, the, the cost between $13,000 uh, to $17,000, and which is basically if you put it back into sort of square mile, like, because we can say one square kilometer is 0.386 square mile, that, that for that, if we have a change of the watershed by one square mile, you will save about thirty-four dollars to $44,000. So that's basically uh, what we are seeing. That's the annual cost to so simplify it for the op water operator. Because if we start throwing all the mathematical equations, they're going to like glaze over. And so what is suggested is that it's very true that the, uh, the, the Trust for Public Land say an increase in forest cover will lead to a decrease in water treatment cost. And that's really, in a sense, what we all kind of concluded and actually another workshop that we did for the uh, Water Research Foundation, we participated in it. And we always say, probably it's going to be very hard for us to precisely quantify what that relationship is across the U.S. Because the watershed is going to be different. The, the ecoregion will be different. But what we know is that that relationship, the, the, the relationship between increasing forest cover, decreasing treatment cost will halt. So at least we know what the direction is. Sometimes all we really can say is that whether the direction is in the right, uh, 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 right direction. So that's what we were uh, uh, seeing, is that 
uh, this is the uh, observation. And also, uh, we noted that in the TPL study and all the ongoing study that we are doing, that collecting a comprehensive data to quantify the relationship among forest cover, water quality, and water treatment costs is not trivial. It actually takes a lot of time, and we, we have discovered that, and, uh, you know, because it takes time for the water operator. The, the problem is that if you think about we have forest cover, we actually defaulted that to using the U.S. Forest Service to do that work. And then the water quality, well, you've got a water quality manager that deal with that part. But when in treatment, the water quality manager doesn't deal with treatment. So they have to go to the operator and actually find out what they are using in terms of their treatment costs. So it's, you've got to get multiple people all in at the same time to figure it out. And, but what we will actually conclude is that under the right circumstances, source water protection effort as a preventative and sustainable approach, use saving in, in treatment. And why do we, I say sustainable? Because if you have source water protection, you don't have to do treatment, you have very little energy input. And, and actually in California, we, we're sort of starting this discussion because they say, well, you know, we don't have a lot of activity in California. Well, that's not really true. In Southern California, they might not have a lot of source water protection activity because if you go to LA, LA get their water from somewhere else, like Colorado River or from uh, uh, the Owens Valley, you know, that's where they get their water. But if you go to Northern California, then source water protection would make sense. So really even at a state level, they should think about it as a more all-encompassing package, portfolio, that you gotta look at different way of getting the water into the urban area. Because in a sense, you really what you're thinking about from the American Water Work Association side is that urban water. You know, people that need that water. Uh, and also what you will find is that that's really only part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the equation. Because there are other people that need a lot of water too. You know, in California, what is the biggest user of water? Agriculture. It's agriculture. But actually, if you measure the water and the return on that investment, it's very small. You know, when you're looking at industrial process and, and residential use, that actually return a lot more. But agriculture is the senior right, so they got the right to use the water first. And they, they, uh, that became quite a big, big discussion. And so when, uh, when Jerry Brown actually say, we're gonna cut water because you, you know California is in a severe drought. They cut water even to the senior right folks. Now they have to cut down 20%. There's a lot of big discussion. It's very heated because you know it's first come first, first come first serve. You know, I always tell my students when they uh, watch the uh, the movies Chinatown. It's not about the dysfunctional family. It's all about water right issue. <laughs> so that's basically what I have. So you got a quick preview, and that's really sort of uh, a lot of the effort that we're trying to do is to quantify if you do source water protection. What kind of saving can you achieve? And, but again, you know, it's not that simple. I mean, I mean I, I, I'm trained through you know, SUNY Buffalo in the, in the geography program. We know is that different watersheds are different. You know, the Hudson River watershed is gonna be different from the Mohawk, and they're all a little different. And so how do you go about identify those commonality and identify what might be an effective way and cost effective because you don't want to, you know, obviously we can clean everything up if we have infinite amount of resources, but we don't. So we are looking at really what are the trade-off. Can you uh, do, do something that achieve uh, protecting the public health and at the same time still allow economic growth? So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes uh, for questions, so uh, Mary? I was wondering how climate change has been factored into the whole conversation because I agree with what you said, but climate change has challenged even sure. more. Yeah, well, I, I did not include climate change in this portion, but we actually, we worked on climate change, like urban resiliency, and how climate change can actually affect water utility. Uh, you, you think about is that a lot of the dis disease outbreak uh, associated with drought and flood. I guess it was something about turbidity. Turbidity? 
No, to, turbidity is an indicator. I mean, it, uh, the whole reason why filtration avoidance will be granted have to be related to turbidity. If your turbidity start going up, you actually can lose your, uh, your filtration avoidance because the turbidity is really about sediment. And you got viruses that can hide behind the sediment. So when they go into a treatment system, it might not be very effective in actually inactivating them. So yeah, there is a relationship. And uh, we got also other challenges. Like for example, um, you know, the cyanobacteria, the cyanotoxin. And that's also related to the water quality issue because in those cases, a lot of it, it's tied back to the nutrient input. So if you're looking at Lake Erie, which of course, Buffalo also draw their water from, you know, nutrient is it's a problem because that's what caused the cyanobacteria to grow very peripherally. Um, and you know, what are the treatments? Well, there are ways. You know, you can use ozonation. I mean, the best way is to to not let them get through to your system, to get it off uh, in the beginning. And so they, uh, there's a lot of work from Ohio that is tried to work on getting less and less nutrient input coming into Lake Erie. Because you know Lake Erie have a dead zone, similar to like the Gulf of Mexico. I think we have, uh, for, if they're very brief questions, one or two more questions back here, please. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if this was something that you did in your study, but, but maybe just getting your opinion. Because you're thinking about you know, adding force in areas where you have Well, the connectivity is a huge issue. Right. And what we see is that, I think if you look at forests, closer to the receiving water, the better it is. So there's a lot of literature on the buffer forest. And because if, if you have develop, development up in the, maybe higher up in the watershed, if they run down and it can intercept by the buffer, there is a benefit to it. But how big is that buffer is still questionable. You know, we have to sort of do more work on that. And then also prevent uh, development on steep slope. The steep slope, we all know, is that causable problem. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up now. Maybe you'll have an opportunity later to, uh, to do some follow-up questions. Yeah, I'll stay around, so you know, feel free to stop by. Thank you very much. Great presentation. To keep it moving, I'd like to introduce Dr. Chuck Steed serves as an adjunct professor of environmental studies at Ramapo College. He's the director of the Ramapo Saltbox Environmental Research Center, program assistant for the town of Ramapo. Chuck has been working on the Ford Motor Company remediation and restoration project at the Ramapo well field since the 1990s, and will be focusing on the status and risk involvement in cleaning up this hazardous contamination. So welcome, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, just start by, up a little higher, uh, focusing on the words town of Ramapo. I think what was imperative in, and is imperative in all the work that I do is the close relationship with municipal municipalities, with government. Um, it's, it's one of the things that um, can be some of the thorniest problems that we have when we're trying to you know, do water preservation and, and work in uh, dealing with our watersheds, but it, it's absolutely necessary. And in my particular case, working with the town of Ramapo, I have had uh, tremendous success in a, a nice collaboration and effort between the town, the participants who are concerned about the watershed as a result of the Ford dumping, the Ford paint sludge dumping in the watershed, and the various organizations that Ford would have to enlist to participate with this. So in other words, we have weekly meetings up at a site where we're doing remediation and the town has charged me to be involved with oversight. This is relatively new. Ford doesn't go around uh, doing remediation and asking citizens to be involved with oversight. But, uh, but we have it. And that's because in our town administration, Christopher St. Lawrence, the town supervisor there, negotiated for that. And uh, so there's been a very, it's, it's a long time in coming, but it's been a very good and a very productive relationship. Is it the little arrow here that I hit? And I just, and I go like that and there. And then the other thing is there, okay. 
So this is uh, welcome to the town of Ramapo. Actually, this is the Ramapo watershed or the heart of the sole source aquifer in the Ramapo watershed. Between 1955 and 1980, when Ford Motor Company in Mawa, New Jersey, which is right next door to here, ran their operations, they de deposited what has been estimated to be over 300,000 tons of lead paint in this region. Now, it's not just here, it's in a number of areas, uh, adjacent watersheds and up in Ringwood, and uh, that's where the heart of it is. There's more paint up in Ringwood than anywhere, but there's plenty of paint here. So let me just introduce you to this location. Uh, Torn Mountain is there, exit 15A off the throughway is right there. So if you ever pull off exit 15A on the throughway as you're coming down the ramp, you're looking up Torn Valley, because this is the Ramapo Pass, that's Ramapo Valley. This is Torn Valley. And when you look up Torn Valley, you see this little area up here. Looks sort of like Teletubby land, if some of you remember what that looks like. And uh, that's a landfill, super fun cap of uh, the Ramapo landfill. So we have that up there in Torn Valley. We also have a uh, substation, electric substation. We have a waste management authority. So we have a few pieces of industry up there. But essentially, Torn Valley is a, it's a beautiful riparian corridor and a part of the Ramapo watershed. Here, at the heart of the watershed, is the Ramapo well field. And that's a closer look at the well field. There's a couple of other structures along Torn Valley Road. But the well field, this, this dark line is the Ramapo River. The Torn Brook comes in up right up there. And that line there is the railroad track. So right in here, those little, little funny lines there, that's all about the um, service roads to get to United Waters wellheads. There are four wellheads there. Peak of season, one of those wellheads can draw 12 million gallons a day. So this is an important watershed right in here and a very important well field. Um, Ford Motor Company in those years, particularly in the late 40s and early 60s, did a, a tremendous amount of dumping right down in this section of the well field. It's not the only place. That was phase one that we worked on, but I'm going to show you in 2013 in the well field. There are other places, and currently if you come up Torn Valley Road, I can walk you around them. There's plenty of other activity over there. We're getting a full remediation out of Ford. In other words, they break into the ground, they find the paint, and they chase it. And that's, that's the words, they chase the paint. So wherever the paint leads them is where they have to go. And this is a well, typical well in the well field. And it's got some debris, some old industrial debris. This was an area that had iron mining, so there's some very old industrial debris. But there's also mounds of stones from old buildings that have been there. Uh, this was also a sand quarry in the 40s and up into through the 50s, even in the 60s for a little while for the Ramapo Land Company. So a lot of the terrain is irregular. A lot of areas look a little mysterious and unusual. And those are perfect areas for paint to be dumped. When Ford was dumping here, there was construction equipment, backhoes, tractors, dump trucks, just sitting up there. And so the dumping was happening at night. And the vehicles would prep the site during the day, trench it out. And then you'd come back the next morning and the trenches would be filled in. So somehow, mysteriously, the paint was going into the soil at night. I know this from firsthand. As a boy, I grew up here. I trapped in the Torn Valley. I would go in late in the evening uh, to, to bait my traps. I'd go back early in the morning to pick up my game. And I saw the activities going from, going from prep for the paint to come in at night and in the morning, all the ground being sealed over. So I witnessed this in a lot of places. And I kept journals. I have a lot of documents on this. And uh, th this is an important picture because when we negotiated with Ford for working in the well field, they said that uh, in the higher terrestrial area they were going to ha have a lay down and for their equipment. And we said, well, you have, to, you have to rise that area. You have to build a platform because this is a, a known uh, floodplain. And they argued that it wasn't. Uh, their examination of the map showed that the higher terrestrial area wasn't. You're looking at sedimentation. Oop, sorry. You're looking at um, sedimentation all in here. Um, it, it's, it crowds out. It gathers around the plants. In some cases, it even surrounds and drowns the plants a bit. Uh, this is right after uh, Hurricane Irene. So any major hurricane, the whole area does flood. So we got it. We got, we got the, the, uh, the platform to be built in what we call the laid down construction area and the waste segregation area. The other thing Ford didn't want to do, because though they're going to spend millions, little things like doing a tree survey for native trees, uh, they push off the table. So we did it. And this is where I start bringing in my students and the community. Now the community was involved up to the point, let's get them here. But my job was to keep engaging the community. And I, you'll see a lot of pictures of students and Ramapo Indians that participated in this whole project and a lot of volunteer work. Here we're doing a tree survey. 
and, and uh, flora survey. It's, it's a hard time to do it. It's in the winter time, but it's important. And what happens is we picked out three sectors, one close to the river, because Ford had given us the feasibility map of what they were proposing to do, and the footprint was restrictive. So we decided to survey the soils outside the footprint where we suspected there was other dumping. So we have some kids there. And this young lady has just found a nice big hunk of exposed lead paint. You can see it right there showing up as she was raking away at the leaves. There it is again. And so I bring in more people and I was doing what I called my toxic legacy tour. And we would go on a walk and we'd identify stuff. We'd talk about the plants and the p uh, potential interaction of the plants with phytoremediation and getting the lead into the plants and then into the animals. And we'd talk about these things. It was a very, it was a fun tour. I'd ask them to bring a, a little bagged lunch and we could sit out by the river. Speaking of the river, there's the river. This stretch of the river was where we pulled out, the town of Ramapo pulled out a lot of timber from Hurricane Irene, so it scarred up the bank. So I thought this would be a good place to study because further up in Tornbrook, Ford had people working for Ford, had dumped lead paint, barrels of it, 55 gallon drums of paint, down the bank into the Tornbrook. So I suspected they did the same thing in the Ramapo. So we studied this, this uh, escarpment right here, and what we found oops, sorry, I'm hitting the wrong button again, is as we look closer into the soils, I started to smell the paint. This paint, by the way, is over 50 years old. It's lead paint, but it has numerous VOCs. Uh, the, the most obvious would be uh, smelling the, um, the, um, oh, the, the word is escaping, nail polish remover. What is that again? Acetone, thank you so much. Let's talk about it all the time, I can remember. Acetone would be the most obvious. Uh, if you step on a piece of Ford paint and just chip it a little bit, uh, the acetone is fresh. It's amazing. DuPont established the compounds, put together the agreement. They had a plasticizer called diethylhexyphthalate, diethyl which actually makes the paint so resilient that it never completely solidifies. And as a result, those solvents are still in there. You break open a piece of, oh, by the way, I have a little display right around the corner and there's some pictures, and there's two chunks of Ford paint encased in little boxes so you can look at them. If you took one of them now and snapped it, you'd smell the acetone. So the solvents don't really escape the material. My kids were raking the bank and they could smell it. So I put masks on them, and sure enough, there it was on the bank. And again, we found it dripping down through the soil where it had been poured. And we decided to put up a siltation fence because the bank was rather loose. And it wasn't easy, it's a steep, rocky bank, and as we were doing it, I'm looking back over my shoulder, and there in the river, I'm plucking out chunks of Ford paint that were still in the river. We told Ford about it, and uh, had a very interesting conversation. It was, uh, took about three days of talk, and we got a geotech surface that was staked down so it would retain the bank. So they came in, and they built their, um, their uh, laydown area and their waste segregation area. That's the area that we wanted built up. And they started working down at the other end, well 97. And what they found, see how close this is to the river, by the way. And what they found while they were working on this area is that the soils would cave in because it was so moist. There was so much water in the soil that they had to create the cells back off the soils, uh, embank them with wood, and carefully work. They had to do this all by hand because they're around infrastructure. You see the pipes down in there, it's a well field. So they couldn't use the machines here. And the soils kept draining back down into the trench. Look at the color that's in the trench. That's paint. Now, whether that's all paint or not, that's mixed with soil, uh, is, it's something that has to be analyzed. Well, it was analyzed then, because the paint is running out of here and then mixing in with the water and spreading out. That's paint. Those are the electric lines for the pump house. Uh, according to United Water, when they laid the lines, they, there was no paint there. Remember what I said about stepping on a piece and smelling it? Well, if you dig it up in moisture, you're going to really smell it. Those lines are laid directly in paint. And that's paint. It ran about 1,000 yards in one trough. It was about 6 to 8 feet wide, and it went down about 6 feet. But it migrated. They had to dig down, dig down lower until they came to soil that did not register any indicators for lead. It was breaking down. Over 40 or 50 years, it was slowly breaking down, and as it did, it was starting to enter into the groundwater. So, of course, they had to have groundwater uh, uh, treatment, and they did a lot of them there. Two of these uh, big structures for doing the uh, water treatment, and they were treating over, uh, roughly over 1,000 gallons 
uh, w within a given morning session of about two hours, and that's just the water that would fall back into the pit. So there was a lot of water there that they had to cope with. Once it was treated, once it passed the test, it could be um, outfalled into the Ramapo River, which is what they were doing. Though they saved some for just spraying down on dry days because you don't want the stuff to pick up with dust. And speaking of dust, they had monitors all over the place. They had to stake down at the end of the day their material. This gets to the other end of it and brings us back to community. I requested, the Ramapo Indians had asked me for this, and I requested it afford that when they leave the area, which by the way produced 42,000 tons of toxic waste in the well field and cost Ford $15 million to remove. Now when they did finally complete this, the, the restoration plan was uh, forested with uh, native trees. We requested a medicine garden. Uh, I don't know if you followed anything about Ford and Ringwood and the Ramapo Indians, but th they're not keen on Indians, so the talk of a medicine garden upset them. And uh, we said, no, we, we need a medicine garden. It's about healing, and we want it built directly on top of the area that had the greatest concentration of toxins. And um, it, it took about three months, but we got it. And they, they were good about it, eventually. And uh, they put in the posts. There you can see the trees are the collared, and that's the reforestation. And out in the middle of it, I don't know, out there are the posts. And uh, it's a deer fence. Heavy, heavy gauge deer fence. I'm proudly at the gate of the, of the deer fence. And then what we did is we re-engaged with the community and had some school kids come because the Ramapos were looking to have sweetgrass and sage be the main product of the medicine garden as well as other medicinal plants. So we built some raised gardens. When you, sweetgrass was once native to the area. When you reintroduce sweetgrass, the Mohawks gave us the guidance on this up at the Aquasasne Reservation. You introduced each garden plot with a spiral and you start planting from the inside of the spiral out. So this is how we set up the plots. And then we had a day a year ago last June, a dedication day for the garden in which the Mohawks came down and the Ramapos uh, came uh, down as well, but they're there already. And a number of community members were there. And it was a very ceremonial thing, but it was the beginning of planting the plants. And we had speakers, that's the chief of the Ramapo tribe. There's another chief. Those are the Mohawk medicine women that came down. That's myself and my wife. We, that day, we asked people to plant a plug for an elder who had passed, and we're planting one for my, uh, my mother-in-law. And we didn't get them all planted, because ultimately we planted 1,000 plugs. So it, it carried on for a number of uh, days. And we did some experimental plots. I don't have time to tell you about them, but we're still, it's an ongoing experiment. We're working with Daniela Shebitz from Kane College in New Jersey on uh, some experimental plots with sweetgrass. And uh, those plots over there are intentionally planted with, um, with clover as a nitrogen fix. And uh, for a long time, it looked like they were buried alive. But sure enough, at the very end of the season, the sweet grass emerges. It's good. It's, it's uh, very pale green to golden. And it's doing very well. Uh, here we are moving some plants around. We, we used uh, rain barrels for watering the system, so it was self-perpetuating. That's a kiosk for people who come by, or information board for people who come by to learn about it. That's our sage. That's our sweet grass there. And that's the sweet grass here. So what we do is we braid it. It's for ceremonial uh, use. I would sell it to you, but you don't sell religious objects. So I, I cannot sell it to you. There are, there are two sitting out on the chunks of paint sludge. What we've done is we've associated the medicinal plants with remediating and restoring the area to the degree that now when people find paint sludge, because we're still finding it they, it, they report it and they bring sweet grass there and burn it at the site. So we do have a strong indigenous influence on how to cope with restoring the land. And this is the building, don't have time to tell you about this, but this is the building we put up. It's a 200-year-old iron workers house. It's on another site further up the valley. And this is our environmental research center that we work with down there through town of Ramapo. And all kids, this is kid built, all kids worked with me on this. But what's neat about this building as we put it up to draw more attention uh, to, to this project, uh, some years, uh, a couple of years before the Wellfield uh, project completed, and we drew enough attention that look at this picture. That's the same building. We knew there was some paint sludge around there. We just initiated the cleanup in what's called uh, Operational Unit 2, where the salt box is, and that's the salt box house, and we found more than some. 
uh, we're up to 550 tons of solid lead paint that's been extracted from this area alone within the past six weeks. So uh, that's it. I don't know if you have time for questions, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. What a, what a presentation. It's amazing uh, to see the remediation that took place there and the restoration. It's incredible to believe that we have done this. We haven't, but Ford has. It's, it's just astonishing. So uh, great project and great presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Question in the back. Did you all hear his question? Did Ford own it and how long did it take? Uh, Ford, Ford actually owned very little of the property they dumped on. Uh, the, it was done illegally. It was private property and they, even the owners themselves didn't know the extent of what was being done. And it, they dumped paint from literally the whole time they were in Mawa, from 55 to 1980. And just a point of the paint and why it gets dumped, 10% of what sprays out of the jet it to the product that they're spraying it on. 90% of the slurry goes down to the floor, is washed down with that mysterious chemical acetone, and, uh, and, then, and then stored to, to be dumped later. Uh, another quick question? Anyone, another question? There was not a plume that was spreading. It did get beyond wherever the paint was found uh, in, the, in the well field by about four feet. So that's not really a plume. It's just starting to get beyond it. The, the trick about this particular substance, not unlike asbestos when it ages, is as it breaks down, it can become more mobile. So the migration hadn't really expediated yet. That's why United Water finally joined us in this campaign to get Ford to do it, because they realized it's starting to pick up a little speed. Maybe there'll be a time when we won't be able to catch it anymore. Okay. Thanks, Thanks again. Guys. Thank you very much for coming. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, but just to let you know, we were going to uh, adjourn at 12.15 and have lunch, and we're returning a little bit early, 12.45, because Al Appleton is now here. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Annabelle Vinois is a master's candidate in environmental policy and sustainability management at the New School. She has a, degree, a law degree. Uh, she comes from Belgium and now living in Woodstock. And she's going to do a Kingston uh, water case study um, on the, fo the challenges that municipalities face to their water supply systems and the role that watershed groups uh, play in this role. Uh, later in the afternoon, Kate Hudson and Rebecca Martin will continue in this discussion, uh, talking about empowering communities to take on water resource protection. Let's welcome Annabelle. Good morning, everyone. Um, I must start by saying that this is a great honor for me to be here and be able to share with such a learned audience a little bit more about what I learned about what I will refer to as the Niagara episode, um, about which I learned while doing some work with the Woodstock Land Conservancy. And so in a few words, the Niagara episode is the failed attempt by a uh, Niagara Bottling, a California-based water bottling company, to buy a large amount of the water supply of the city of Kingston in New York State. So I believe that some valuable lessons can be drawn from the, this Niagara episode for watershed collaboratives or anyone really thinking about watershed level management. Let me tell you how I arrived to this conclusion. So let me start with this picture here. Uh, and on September 16, 2014, a civil engineer came to a meeting of the Town of Ulster's planning board, and he represented the privately owned Niagara Bottling Company based in Ontario, California, and submitted an application to build a water bottling factory at the site known as Tech City. The plant would manufacture single-serve plastic bottles and fill them with spring and filtered water. 
included in the plans was a provisional will serve letter from the Kingston Water Department. Niagara needed up to 1.75 millions of gallons of water a day, and that's what they wanted to know if the Kingston Water Department could provide this. The department said yes, that they had sufficient capacity to provide one million of gallons of water a day within the first six months, and that after some infrastructure modifications, they would be able to meet the demand of 1.75 millions of gallons a day. It should be noted here that the Kingston water, and so Kingston being, city of Kingston is here, but that the water actually comes from the Mink Hollow stream that in, and that it is diverted into the Cooper Lake Reservoir, which is located in the town of Woodstock. So I'm sure that you can see where this is going. And in addition to the plans with the Kingston Water Department, the proposal also called for a second bottling line that would be supplied with water purchased via contracts with multiple private spring owners in the area. And it's very significant to note that the only publicly identified deal was actually on the opposite side of the Hudson River in the town of Red Hook in Dutchess County. So in this session, I will give you a brief overview of the facts and complexities of the Niagara episode while looking at it through the lens of watershed collaboratives and watershed politics. And this afternoon, two speakers, Kate Hudson, of Riverkeeper and Rebecca Martin of Kingston Citizens, some of the key players in the Niagara episode will give us much more information about this complex case study, and in particular, about the stunning role that citizens' advocacy groups have played in daylighting the many problematic environmental, economic, regulatory, and political aspects of the Niagara proposal. And these efforts are probably linked to the decision on February 13, 2015 by the Niagara Board of Directors to drop their plans for Ulster County. Although Niagara officials never said why they dropped their plans. So I was particularly interested in understanding how this proposal was able to get so far and garner significant early backing from various local, county, and state agencies including potential major New York State economic development support. And this led me to wonder why and how the existing watershed group was not able to prevent this extremely controversial deal. Did I do something wrong? Oh, no. Okay. So. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I think there's a full moon this week, so. <laughs> Halloween, it's coming on. It just makes me That's okay. I actually, I can keep going, it's fine. Yeah, sure. So, I will come back to these maps, the maps that I wanted to show you. I'll get back to them anyways and give you more explanation later on. Um, but so, in order to answer all these questions that I had, I analyzed the existing literature about um, infrastructure finance, watershed management, watershed politics, and then I looked at all the public documents, or all the documents at least that were made public thanks to uh, Kingston Citizens' work. It's mostly on their website, but also on the City of Kingston's website, and some on the Kingston Water Department's website. There were also numerous local newspaper articles about this issue. And to complement the readings, I conducted interviews of various stakeholders, including Mary McNamara of the Esopus Creek Conservancy, Rebecca Martin of Kingston Citizens, and Amanda Laval of Ulster County Environment, who, by the way, wrote a stellar thesis titled Watershed Bridges and Watershed Divides that I highly recommend. That's great. Um, and so I'll get back to this map, so don't worry too much. I just want to give you some first perspective. Uh, and I should say here that the Kingston Water Department declined to be interviewed. 
So let's talk a little bit about watershed collaboratives and their origins. So the whole idea of resource management at the watershed level emerged at the beginning of the 20th century. And at first, integrated control and command institutions were created at the federal and state levels, and they proved very effective in addressing point sources of pollution. But as watershed management had to move beyond addressing supply, water supply questions to incorporate goals such as river restoration or species and habitat protection, and just generally addressing the presence of humans within the watershed, these integrated organizations proved to be ill-adapted. And so this gave rise in the late 1980s to what is called the watershed movement. And this movement sparked the creation of collaborative partnerships such as watershed collaboratives. So watershed collaboratives have the advantage of often representing a broad range of interests. They combine governmental expertise and finances with local knowledge and commitment. And then this information is shared among all the stakeholders in an open way. And solutions are often discussed based on a consensus decision-making basis. They have achieved positive results such as obtaining higher water quality in various places. However, there is no one-size-fits-all solution that should be used by everyone everywhere. And watershed collaboratives come in all sizes and shapes. They can be mostly led by governmental entities, mostly by citizens' organizations, or by a mix of both. And empirical studies conducted on watershed partnerships have revealed, among other things, that the most successful partnerships were the ones where the people, the actors themselves, perceived that something was a crisis that they needed to work on. Also, obviously, the ones with higher levels of trust and good norms of reciprocity would be, would be more successful. <clears throat> Sorry. It is mostly so when trust between partners exists that watershed collaboratives can become useful, legitimate places where problems and solutions to watershed management can be discussed. But watershed collaboratives have also limited powers since they cannot make binding decisions and they still rely on the gov government to apply whatever solutions they came up with. So how does all this apply to the Niagara episode? To fully understand this, you need to know a few specificities of Kingston and surrounding area. First, the proposed site for building the, for building the plant, which is located just miles north of the city of Kingston. It was from 1955 to 1995 used by IBM that employed up to 7,100 people. The water supply to the IBM plant was purchased via a long-term contra contract with Kingston Water Department and was approved via a, <coughs> via a water sale permit issued by NYSDC. However, in 1998, IBM closed its operations in the town of Ulster, and the site was sold and renamed Tech City. Ever since, the majority of the site has languished. The property contains an EPA brownfield site, including a toxic water plume resulting from IBM's operation. It is a major fiscal thorn in Ulster County's side. Niagara made a business proposal that could prevent the county to foreclose on the site. Also, with the closing of the IBM site, the Kingston Water Department, a financially and administratively independent government agency, lost an important part of its revenues, 95% of which comes from the sale of water. So once the Niagara proposal was made public via the press on September 16, 2014, things got very complicated very quickly. And as a testament to the complexity of the Niagara episode, here is a list of some of the actors involved. And this is mostly the actors that we saw in The Seeker, but there are other entities around that. Um, <clears throat> and so, and all this, as well as the consequences, will be explained in greater detail this afternoon by Kate Hudson and Rebecca Martin. So one of the things that citizens groups found astonishing was that so many actors at all levels had actually already agreed to the proposal and how each of these actors had made this decision based on their small jurisdiction. Some examples. At the state and the city of Kingston level, 
It was mostly a question of economic development. So this is why the Regional Economic Development Council and Startup NY were considering granting Niagara up to $10.8 million in grants and 10 years of significant tax abatements. Elster County Community College just wanted to find a long-lasting job and internship opportunity for its students. Elster County, like I said, had a big fiscal stake in the Tech City property. And the Kingston Water Department explained numerous times that the Niagara proposal was the best way to, fun to fund their capital improvement plan of $18 million, and that without Niagara, they would have to raise the water rates to unprecedented levels. The lack of transparency, and also the obvious fragmentation of the decision making, and some believe even the deliberate segmentation of the project that would weaken a seeker, were all very disturbing to both citizen groups as well as elected officials of the town of Woodstock and the city of Kingston. These groups, though, were remarkably fast in action and they gained a popular following that was truly mind-blowing. There are probably some factors that explain why the public went up in arms on this issue. For example, I can think of the important media coverage of the California drought, the effortless visualization of tanker trucks literally sucking Cooper Lake dry, the well-known information about the pollution due to plastic bottles, the precedence of water privatization and the public opposition to that privatization from the US to Bolivia to India. All these factors combined with great community organizing led to public hearings with rooms packed with hundreds of citizens. So the diversity of the actors, the diversity of actors and the obvious fact that water doesn't know any political boundary led the citizen groups to advocate for a watershed approach. So it is interesting to note here that there was a watershed collaborative in place then. In 2001, the Sawkill Watershed Alliance was founded by some municipalities like the town of Woodstock and some citizens. They were mostly created to tackle two concrete issues, damage to a local stream and flooding. So let me show you again. So this is the Isopus watershed, as you can see. Um, when Woodstock is here, Kingston, city of Kingston is there, Ulster is here. Um, and so it was created to tackle these issues and the success, success and work of the Socket Watershed Alliance laid the foundation for the Lower Isopus Watershed Partnership, or LOOP, in 2007. It was an intermunicipal watershed collaborative uh, that was created after the dramatic floods of 2005. After the elections of 2010 and 2011, however, the coalition became mostly dominated by one political party, which created an imbalance between the different goals that existed at the time where Loop was created. So Loop was divided and the communication between the municipalities had actually broken down by the time that Niagara came in. So there were different layers of politics superimposed here. Traditional politics that's mostly divided over questions of water quality, uh, versus flooding, but also politics of place. So, for example, the lower Esopus communities were mostly located downstream, cared about flooding and water quality, but the lower Esopus communities located upstream cared mostly about flooding. And most importantly, they tried to solve the dramatic tension between environmental protection and economic development. So it should be noted that both the town of Ulster and the city of Kingston were part of Loop, but the Kingston Water Department was not specifically represented. This is an important weakness of collaborative partnerships. While they are very dependent on who is part of them, they can't require an organization to be part of it. And this is particularly important when you consider, for example, the existing tensions between the town of Woodstock and the Kingston Water Department that existed before Niagara and that are still here today. So after a certain amount of time, Loop did the opposite of what watershed collaboratives aim to do, namely creating a more direct democracy. And another issue that emerged during the Niagara episode is that watershed management involves clear boundaries definition. 
And that's a crucial process, but it's often tainted by the actor's own agendas, who actually take advantage of the nested nature of the watershed. So for example, the Kingston Watershed Department defines on his website that the watershed that feeds the city of Kingston is the Mink Hollow watershed of 8.6 square miles, which is true. But it's also true that the Mink Hollow is part of the Beaver Kill watershed and that Cooper Lake is actually part of the Sauk Hill watershed. And for the NYCDP, for example, they would refer to it as the Ashokan watershed and other people would talk about the Esopus watershed. So no wonder that creating institutions at the watershed level is so complicated. This being said, the experience that the citizens' organization had garnered in the past working through watershed collaboratives did help them to react really fast and effectively once a crisis emerged. Kingston citizens, for example, had done a lot of community organizing in the past. Riverkeeper had been active in the area, of course, and they, had, they were excellent legal and technical resource. Esopus Creek Conservancy had strong relationships with the town of Sagardes. Woodstock Land Conservancy had excellent communication with the town of Woodstock, with other conservation organizations, and with Ulster County. So this leads me to an important observation that lies in the fact that the existing watershed collaborative loop but as well as the informal group that was an ad hoc response to the Niagara episode, were all created in times of crisis, and they were most successful when they coalesced around one threat. This confirms what has been found in literature about watershed collaboratives. Once Niagara left, it wasn't easy to keep a productive conversation going. Going from reactive to proactive is really tough. And so this being said, there are many positive and encouraging consequences about which you will hear more this afternoon. So in conclusion, the Niagara episode highlighted severe economic, political, and natural resource management issues. But it also showcased the strength of vigilant citizens groups who have experience in lobbying for local, state, and even federal entities in the face of a pressing threat. It is clear, though, that balancing the needs of all the actors in the watershed that provides water to the city of Kingston and its surrounding areas will be extremely challenging. And that post Niagara, actually, there's not much goodwill left among some actors. Most importantly, many actors who would be essential participants in such a watershed co coalition, like the Kingston Water Department, have made it clear that they have no interest of being part of this. So I don't know how, effect, uh, how an effective and balanced watershed coalition could be formed short of another water emergency, galvanizing the public and forcing change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annabelle, for your presentation. Thank you to all the speakers uh, for their present wonderful presentations. Uh, just a word about the rest of the day. Um, we will, the afternoon session will begin at 1 o'clock promptly, so we don't have a lot of time for lunch. So uh, you can take your, get your lunch. It's in the hallway. Uh, take your seats. And then when the doors are open, we'll move to the front of the room for the plenary session this afternoon. Thank you all for coming.